Good morning, everyone. I see the attendees number just kind of <laughs> scrolling in. I love it. So exciting. It's like people came to our party. I know. <laughs> We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. Um, we want to obviously honor everyone's time and also acknowledge that, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I'm Puerto Rican. So for me, on time is like, three minutes past the time you told me to be there. So I want to be, I want to honor my people and acknowledge that starting on time means a couple minutes um, after the scheduled time. But we really want to make sure that um, folks are um, taking care of themselves. If you had to go to the bathroom in between meetings or, you know, go grab some water, whatever you need to do, um, we'll be here waiting for you. So we'll just get started in a couple minutes. Well, welcome and good morning, everyone, for everyone who's, let me guess, west of the East Coast. It's still morning. <laughs> I'm like working on my time zones here. Um, so welcome. Good morning. I am Andrea Perez Michaela. I use she, her pronouns or ella in Spanish, and I'm the program manager for diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Office of Equity, of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the School of Public Health. Um, so I will be your moderator this morning. Um, before we begin, I first want to acknowledge that the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche, which loosely translates to the land where the waters reflect the skies. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. I also wanna point out that closed captioning is available you can access that by using the icon in the bottom right corner of your screen. You can also reach out to Sarah Harris, who is providing our tech support for today, via the chat to ask questions about accessibility. We will monitor the chat for questions, as well as share links to our evaluation and information about future Justice and Public Health events, which the next one will be on December 7th. The Justice and Public Health series was started last year as part of the School of Public Health's commitment to justice and anti-racism. We have been hosting monthly events with local and national experts around topics of public health. The speakers and presentations in the series help to ground us in theory and practice, as well as complement the classroom learning that our students experience. We also hope that today's discussion is part of a broader change that's happening outside of the School of Public Health, if you're interested in staying abreast of other Justice and Public Health events, please be sure to fill out our event evaluation after this and check the box to receive notifications about upcoming events. You might also visit our website at any time. This event will be recorded and will be available to view on our website for about 180 days. So now I wanna welcome our speaker for today. I have the privilege to have known Tristan professionally for a couple of years now. Um, wanting to um, invite him today, understanding that there are many intersections between transgender justice and public health that have emerged, especially in the last couple of years. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that we're also having this event just two days after election day. So understanding um, the consequences and repercussions of our voting choices as well. Um, all research on the impacts of COVID-19 vaccines and illness on pregnancy has exclusively concentrated on cisgender women. The overturning of Roe 
and subsequent cultural debate about inclusive language has thrown many trans folks into upheaval as existing allies and coalitions falter and fall apart in the face of such a grievous attack on reproductive choice. And reproductive health is something that we are very passionate about at the School of Public Health, and I'm excited to bring Tristan into the conversation to provide um, additional context as, into why it's important to not um, center cisgender women in the conversation around reproductive health. So Tristan Reese is a transgender speaker and author whose work sits squarely at the intersection of reproductive justice and transgender inclusion. An adoptive and gestational parent, Tristan is dedicated to creating more accessible, equitable health systems for families of all kinds. Tristan spent the better part of a decade on the front lines of the transgender movement, organizing communities across the country to defend themselves against well-funded political attacks. But he is perhaps best known for his work as a storyteller, which can be found on the Moth Radio Hour and many other podcasts and live shows. In his books, how We Do Family, which is conveniently behind me. That's right. I am I feel like I'm on like MSNBC or something, just like pointing at the book in the back. Um, he recounts the unique way he and his partner became parents overnight to their niece and nephew. They all live in Portland and are very, very happy. So welcome, Tristan, to our space this morning. Thank you. The they are very happy thing. I feel like is always like um, aspirational. You know, I'm like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put it out into the universe <laughs> that that we are very happy. Um, but as we were talking about before we started this morning, parent parenthood has lots of bumps along the way. So yeah, thank you so much for having me here, Andrea, um, as well as to everyone else who who made this conversation possible. So excited to chat with you all. And yes, we're in the middle of like, we're like living through history right now, um, given that election day was just uh, just a couple of days ago. And in fact, we don't have the outcome of many of these really vital fights across the country yet. So it'll be interesting and exciting to see how it all shakes out. Although I was very excited, I supported the, the Michigan campaign uh, to protect abortion rights. And I got to do some work with them specifically on gender inclusion and messaging and framing. Um, so I was really excited to see that they had a, a handy victory there. Uh, so that's like, whoo, all right. Um, okay. Well, first I wanna acknowledge I'm not in my normal home base. I'm uh, on a small island, medium-sized island off the coast of Seattle called Whidbey Island right now. Um, I came up to take care of a friend, a dear friend who was in an accident. Um, so I've been with him all week. I guess I'm in this like hipster sort of old-timey ship-themed <laughs> hotel. And so thanks for uh, bearing with me as it looks like I'm joining from the backwoods of a cabin. But I don't know if you can see it because of the lighting, but there is ocean right there. So that's pretty cool. Um, I like to start off my trainings just by sort of grounding as much as possible in, in where we are physically and where we are emotionally or mentally or politically, um, just because it, it helps me do the work from that place. Um, yeah, and before I ask you all to hop into the Q&A and tell me what questions you're bringing in, speaking of grounding, I want to start with a little poem, because again, I think we, I just want to invite everyone to be present with all in all the ways, um, both physically and emotionally and mentally. And this is just a teensy little bit of a poem from a, a poet named Marge Piercy, and it goes like this. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. And each day you mean one more. And the reason that I love that little fragment of a poem is because I think it really, for me, centers why I do this work and what I hope to bring to you all today. And then more broadly in my work in general, um, that clarity, right? That like when we say inclusion or when we say trans people, or when we say reproductive justice, what do we, what do we mean that we know who we mean and we're committed to always broadening the confines of of what that we is and there's also some of this work is a little plodding you know what i mean like it's a little boring it's one at a time it's like learning a new word today um and it's also about action you know not just not just thinking but also being and also doing and so thinking you know starting from this place i really would love to just 
invite you all to hop into the chat and tell me who, where you're joining from today. Helpful for me to get a little bit of a mental map, a little mental picture. Um, also, I'm going to be talking a lot about what's happening state by state, as well as federally, in terms of transgender health uh, protections, attacks, etc. So I like to know, it's like, ooh, okay, we got some folks from Montana. I'm going to pull out that little Montana story, um, or Michigan, or, you know, Minnesota, you know, wherever y'all happen to be. So hop in the chat and just tell me, make sure you use that drop down so that I can uh, and make sure you use that drop down and then use it to send a panelist or host. And that way I'll be able to uh, I'll be able to see see you all your answers. OK. Oh, it's doing that thing where when I'm sharing, I'm not able to see the chat, even if I click on it. Well, I don't like that. Um, all right. Did well, you close invite... it now? Because it looks um, fine now. Do the what? Did you close it, the chat? No, I did oh. not close the chat. All I did was I, um, you know, looked at the, I changed the optimize the video. for video. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. So I'm whatever still, you did, it worked fine because it, it kind of went away at the end. Yeah, but then I, I, could, I still can't see it if I'm sharing. That's all right. So I'll stop sharing for one second just to see. Um, yeah, that's what that box thing on the bottom was. I got that. Great. So in Minneapolis, but from Spokane, so not too far from where I am. Wonderful. So lots of folks from Minnesota. That's what I thought. Just wanted to, to check in since I know this is a more public event. Folks from Michigan, um, St. Paul, Minnesota, Southern Minnesota. Amazing. Pennsylvania. All right. Wonderful. I'm really excited uh, to see everyone. Southern Wisconsin. Ooh, the WI threw me for a second. I was like, Wyoming? No. Wisconsin. Got it. Um, okay. Great. I'm going to go back to sharing then and just introduce you a little bit to me. Normally from, and well, Canadian by birth, but normally living in Portland right now, joining you from, uh, from Whidbey Island. Um, some of the lenses I bring, I'm white, I'm a white immigrant, um, I'm gay or queer, depending on what, who I'm talking to, I'm transgender myself, and I'm going to talk about what that means just to give us a little bit of a base in a few minutes. Um, what else? It was mentioned already in my bio at the top by Andrea, but um, I really have spent the last 20 years or so um, working in LGBTQ plus political context, doing a lot of community organizing, uh, really traveling the country, helping local communities um, who are facing attacks on their protections, from everything from discrimination to abortion and parental notification. I've done a lot of work around criminal justice, um, a lot of work supporting prisoners, death penalty reform or abolition. Um, and yeah, so I've worked all over the country. So a lot of the stories that I'm going to be telling are both meta. So like, what's the data tell us is happening around the country, as well as personal. So what, how have I actually seen these play out on the ground in these different mm -hmm. situations? Um, I always think that's kind of useful and interesting to hear. And you don't think, I don't think you hear from a lot of political organizers who've actually like knocked on doors and talked to thousands of voters about some of these some of these laws. Um, so that's what I'll be bringing today. Um, seven and a half of those years were spent at the National LGBTQ plus task force. Um, some years were spent doing specifically uh, queer and trans immigration work, some work with youth. So lots of different things. I am a parent, as was already mentioned. Uh, my kids range in age from five to 14. So send help, it's a lot. Uh, um, and then most of my work is done in the fertility, family building and reproduct reproductive justice space. Um, and yes, I wrote a book about my family's journey. Um, and then I wrote a children's book as well with my partner um, called The Light of You. And uh, because this isn't the place where I normally call home, um, I'm not going to know how to pronounce, and I do not want to uh, totally d ruin the pronunciation of the first word here. Um, I'm very familiar with the, the Skagit, the Suquamish, the Tulalip, and I'm not as familiar with Stiligwamish people, um, and so I have some learning to do myself. I'm very familiar with the uh, indigenous people who stewarded the lands um, in and around Portland. Um, yeah, so I've got, got some work to do about here, but I at least wanted to bring bring those names and recognition of those names into the space today. Okay, what else? We are recording. So 
how can we develop some safety and some bravery around the fact that we are recording? Here are some parameters that I put in place that I encourage um, that I encourage you all to understand. So both in the chat and in the Q and A, I invite you to bring the words you have. So even if you aren't exactly sure how to ask a question, you know ask it the way that you know how to ask it and we can work from there. It really is my job to steward your learning today. It's not your job to take care of me. So don't worry about me. I'm good. Um, um, bring the words you have, you know, of course, try to ask questions out of curiosity and openness, you know, and, and kindness, but I, you know, that's fine. We'll figure it out together. Um, but I do really encourage you to use the chat and the Q&A, knowing that I'm not going to share your name. So I won't say, and Stephanie is asking why trans people always blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to do that. So that's another way that hopefully you can get your question asked. You can be brave and ask that question, but also, you know, also be safe, not worry that, you know, this might go out in a recording publicly, and then everyone will know you had that question about trans people. So those are the things that I, I'm inviting. I also just want to name, you know, they said that the that the captions are going. I'm going to play a couple of really short videos and we've got captions on on those, although one, the captions are really bad and I apologize for that. I do not own the video, so I couldn't figure out how to fix it. Um, but part of the way that my brain works, I have ADHD and, and one of the superpowers is that um, I move really quickly. Um, I talk quickly, uh, I make connections in my brain quickly, and also I like eat, sleep, and breathe this work. And so it is not uncommon that someone will pop in the chat and say, hey, could you slow down? Could you explain that again? Can you explain that in a different way? Um, I love that. Please don't be embarrassed about that. In fact, it's the opposite. You should be really proud that you're taking care of yourself and asking for what you need to get what you want out of this session. Um, I'm never going to shame you for that. Again, I'm just only going to ever be grateful that you've given me a new way or a different way to show up for you. So I'm going to move quickly, but please, please don't be embarrassed or afraid to hop, hop in the chat or the Q&A and put your questions in. Um, and the way that I like to move is don't save your questions for the end. Don't save your chat comments for the end. Don't, don't save your Q&A for the end. Um, ask as we go. Um, again, like you don't have to worry about distracting me or, or anything like that. Um, yeah, and I'm going to stop sharing so I can see. Um, yeah, and I am comfortable sharing my pronouns. They are he, him. <clears throat> Normally that's in my name and I realize I'm not hosting this meeting. And so I, I have the opportunity right now um, to rename myself and I can model that. And then anyone else who wants to do that can do it as well. I put change it to Tristan, he, him, and that way, you know, and anyone who wants to share, you're welcome to, uh, anyone who isn't, that's okay as well. All right. So what are we going to do today? Um, who knows? I'm just kidding. I have some ideas. Um, I do want to ground us in just some basic education around some common um, words and phrases and concepts, just so that we're all kind of, we're just level setting. For some of you, it's going to feel uh, boring and repetitive, maybe even too rudimentary. Okay. For others of you, you may find that you're grateful to just uh, come into this space as a new or a learner and already be introduced to some concepts and language you can start to use. Um, and then you can also take those concepts back to your teams if you have a team or teams. Um, again, just to help make sure that everyone understands what you're talking about when you talk about some of these ideas. Then, and then this is gonna be the bulk of our conversation today, we're really gonna dig into what's happening right now in the trans movement, or even, unfortunately, we're going to talk mostly about the anti-trans movement. What's happening? What's what's the like ebb and flow of, of political fights um, <clears throat> for trans folks? Where did it come from? Why is it here? Um, and perhaps more importantly, how do we move past or defeat some of the most egregious attacks facing the trans community right now? Um, and then we're going to talk about what can you do next, you know, in the public health sector, what are some of the common barriers, and then what are some strategies that you can deploy um, for making sure that you're showing up for trans people um, in the in the best possible way, or in alignment with your values. That's often how I think about this work is, 
often the people who come to my sessions are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't have to t tell me that trans people are good. I know that. What do I do now? Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to hit on that. Uh, and again, questions throughout. And I'm, I'm going to try and hold some time sacred at the end um, for specific Q&A, since I know not everyone can ask questions while learning at the same time. So I want to hold space for that. So then finally, before we hop into our very first get in the chat and let's have a conversation, just some parameters around our conversation today. Today, we're really here to think about public health, to think about trans people, to understand what's happening in the policy realm. Right? And we're going to try and do that in an environment where you can feel brave enough to be humble and to be wrong and to learn and to grow and safe enough to ask that question that's right at that learning edge for you. Um, I'm really not here. Um, I've done a lot of my work in the persuasion space. That's not the muscle I'm using today. Um, this isn't a place where I'm going to try and change anyone's minds about whether or not trans people should be allowed to exist. Um, it's not a place where I'm going to debate any of the policies. You know, I'm only here to speak to the harm that these policies have, have had and, and have currently and will have on trans people in the future. Um, and so any questions or, or chat discussions that are in that sort of like, convince me this is wrong or bad realm, I, I'm going to let go of those for today. Um, and save them for a different kind of a space. And I do want to set the expectation that, unfortunately, we're going to have to discuss and name some of the, the most egregious transphobic attacks. Um, so if you are a trans or non-binary person, um, please just know that up front, anything that you need to do to take care of yourself ahead of time, I'm not going to be offended if you know you like drop off and then come back. I'm also probably not going to be able to do a trigger warning before like before every single mention, because it's kind of the whole training. Um, it's really woven in, unfortunately, because that's what we're here to talk about. So just wanted to give folks that um, that heads up ahead of time. So hopefully all that makes sense. I am going to stop share and just double check going into the chat here. Um, yeah, so I'm already starting to get some questions. Um, you know, someone is already asking about um, language around advocating for women's rights. What language can you use to be inclusive of trans women and those who have other identities? Yeah, we're going to get to that for sure towards the end. So thanks for that. So the first thing I want to talk about is just like, why? Why is this important in public health? And I, before I tell you what I think my reasons are for why you should care about this, hop in the chat and tell me why is this so important i mean again we're like two days past midterm elections i don't even want to think about how close we are to the next presidential election don't even don't don't hit me with that on a wednesday morning is it wednesday i think it is so don't don't ask me about that thursday oh my god it's thursday so don't 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 hit me with that but for you why is this something you care about of all of the things that are important and should be important why is this sort of made it into the top five things that you are spending your time thinking about and doing today? I'm going to stop sharing so I can see that chat. <clears throat> yeah, so someone says, you know, so many people are harmed at a basic human level by non-inclusion. Yeah, thank you for that. Trans people are people. Trans rights are human rights. Because I deserve to live a happy and healthy and pleasure-filled life, and so does the rest of my community. Yeah. LGBTQ plus people have poorer health outcomes and trans folks perform lower than the whole group. And that makes me mad. <laughs> yeah. I think it is important because I'm not transgender, but I support them because they will support them. Yeah, supporting people to support themselves. Wonderful. I am a human. Yeah, support my work and reproductive health. Wonderful. My goal is to become a counselor. I want to be able to curate a space for transgender humans to feel safe speaking with me. Everyone should be treated the same no matter what. Yeah, so even just from what I've shared, you all are starting to see the different threads of values that drive this work. And one thing I really advise both allies and trans folks ourselves is to understand that everyone comes to this work from different places. So some people are that like, you know, 
I am a human, trans people are human, like we are, we are each other's keeper, right? We are all interconnected. And that's one value that is woven into the sort of like pro-trans or supportive of trans movements. Um, other people are saying, you know, that LGBTQ people have poor health, health outcomes, right? And that's that like practical, like, look, if you're doing public health, you have to look at who's not being served and then figure out how to serve them. Better, right? That's another value that can be woven into your advocacy work. Um, other people, it is that professional thing, right? Like, I want to do this work. I want trans people to feel safe. So I want to learn about what might lead them to not feel safe and make sure that I'm implementing proactive protocols, right? So we've got all these different frames that are starting to come into view just from this specific space with 80 people. So keep those coming in. I'm gonna share some of my reasons why I think it's particularly important for public health professionals um, to be paying attention to trans folks. Number one, listen, there's a lot of us and there's just gonna be more. So even if you're not totally sure, like I don't really get the trans thing, that's fine, that's why I'm here. Um, even if you're like, mm, I, this isn't really a huge population of people that I serve. Okay. And I don't want to threaten you with irrelevancy. Of course not. But do you want to stay relevant as a professional, as a provider, as a colleague or coworker in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on how old you are and how long you expect to be working? If so, this is something you are going to have to be at the very least fluent in, right? Some of the language, some of the concepts. Um, this is something that if you want to continue to be relevant into the future, it's going to be helpful for you to know because we're a growing population. We also know that in terms of accessing medical care, sometimes it can be difficult, particularly in public health contexts, for trans people to access care because only about one in five trans people have all of our legal documents in alignment. So I'm one of those people who does not have, I'm one of the 80% that does not have our legal doc, my doc, legal documents in alignment. Um, so I mentioned already, I'm Canadian by birth. My Canadian birth certificate still says female. It still has my birth name on it because I can't figure out how to change it. <laughs> I've tried over the years, and for a long time, if you wanted to change your birth certificate or your uh, your name or legal sex on your birth certificate, you in Canada, you had to have had bottom surgery, which I've never had. I do not want to have. But the reason that was in place is because of one of the assumptions about trans people. One of the assumptions about trans people is that all of us want our bodies to align as closely medically with medical definitions of male and female, right? It's kind of like a, just like a prevailing myth or a stereotype or a belief about trans people. And in Canada, because of socialized medicine, it's like, okay, well, if all trans people want to transition fully or want to have top surgery, bottom surgery, the whole kit and caboodle, if that's a belief, and the belief is that the barrier to that is money, well, in Canada, socialized medicine will cover that Therefore, all trans people are going to get bottom surgery. Therefore, you have to have had bottom surgery to prove that you're trans and get your birth certificate changed. Now, that has been changed, I've heard, in the last, I don't know, five years or so. I still cannot figure out the paperwork. So if any of you are Canadian lawyers, call me. <laughs> but it's a really good example of people who may come into your work where they're birth certificate says one thing, their uh, driver's license says something different, their social security card might be different, their insurance, Medicaid, Medicare card might say something different, right? That's very common. And it's one of the most common barriers to care, that trans folks worry that when we show up and our uh, insurance card says female, but we look like me, what's going to happen to us, right? So again, looking at those disparity in care, those disparity in, at the systems level. We also know, according to the very most up-to-date data, that about 50% of trans people and 68% of trans people of color have experienced some kind of mistreatment at the hands of a provider. And that was actually just in the last, the year previous to when this study 
was taken, this survey was taken. So within the course of one year, 50% of trans people have undergone some kind of mistreatment at the hands of a provider. And it's just really important to hit on that because the kind of people who come to this training are probably not the kind of people who are going to mistreat trans folks, at least not intentionally, right? And so even if you're like, well, I would never do that, good for you. Are you totally sure that everyone you work with wouldn't? Are you totally sure that there aren't things that you're doing unintentionally that might land as mistreatment for some trans patients or research subjects or whomever you happen to be working with? Um, and even if you're perfect, and even if the people that you work with are perfect, what about the rest of the world, right? There's always work to be done. We also know that about 50% of trans adults have had insurers deny them coverage for gender affirming care. And in fact, this is one of the streams of anti-trans legislation policy ballot measures that are getting pushed out is actually prohibiting providers from providing trans of gender affirming care or prohibiting insurers from providing, from covering trans affirming care. So this continues to be an issue. And then this is really what we're going to dig into today. But in the U.S. this year alone, we've had over 150 anti-transgender laws. Every state except for two has tried to pass some kind of attack on transgender people. And so that's why I happen to think that it's important. Um, love all of the, you know, extra things that you all uh, put in the chat. And I'm actually going to pop back over to the chat and see what the what the things are here. Um, what else? Oh yeah. So someone says, as a non-binary person, I can't I can't have all my docs documents uh, documentation in alignment with my gender. Yep. Yeah, so you might have an X marker on your driver's license because you live in one of those states, but your passport still has to say M or F, although apparently in 2023 at a time TBD, they'll get that figured out. Um, yeah, ooh, yeah, and someone says that they work on prior authorizations for gender-affirming health care for patients, and it's so hard to get insurance to cover hormones and other medications. Yeah, it really is. Um, okay, well, then I'm going to keep... Moving forward. So before we dig into that, the, the laws, the policy pieces, I do again want to start with just like laying the base um, for some of the common terminology that's used. Someone's already asking about like gender inclusive language and in like pamphlets and handbooks and insurers. I work with a lot of corporations who want to make sure that their benefits, time off, handbook, that all of that is gender inclusive. Um, in order to do so, it's pretty important to understand just some of the underlying concepts that we talk about. So number one, I want to introduce something to you that was created by uh, a really incredible queer physician and, and probably one of the leading researchers on transgender reproductive health, um, Dr. Juno Abedin Maliver. And she encourages providers to think about three things that seem to stand in contrast to each other but actually can all work in concert with each other. So number one, the trans community, transgender people, transgender patients, at our core, we are just like everyone else. We wanna be able to have kids or not, <laughs> when and how we choose. We wanna live in communities that are safe and affirming for us. We wanna be able to go to school if we wanna go to school or not, if we don't, right? Like the things that make most of us human, it's the same. We wanna be treated respectfully right? We don't have to pay an arm and a leg for healthcare, all the same. And transgender people are different from everyone else. We just are. Number one, because we've had to deal with transphobia. So that means we have our own unique resiliency, resiliency strategies. We have our own culture. We have our own language. We have our own fashion. Hello. <laughs> There's like always a joke about like, why do trans people have like so many tattoos and piercings? So like, you can't really see, but like, I'm just like covered in, you know what I mean? Like we have our own stuff. Um, we also have our own tenderness, right? We have our own, someone has talked about this in terms of like, 
you know, we each of us are kind of wearing boots or sandals it, it, with different parts of our identities. And a lot of trans people, we tend to wear sandals, right? We're just a little bit more exposed. We're just like a little bit more prone to get stomped on around gender, pronouns, names, things like that. Um, yeah. And so we are, we're different. And that's why when systems say, well, we just want to treat everyone the same. I'm like, that's a great goal, except we're not all the same, right? And so I think that's where some of the language that you all have already put in that chat around understanding that if outcomes are not the same, if they're disparate outcomes, necessarily programs to address those outcomes are going to have to be tailored to certain communities. So these things are both true. Same, same, but different. And there's a third one, which is trans people have differences between each other. Right. So some folks have already hopped in the chat and identified as trans. Guess what? I'm going to say some things from my experience that they're going to be like, ooh, love that for Tristan. Not true for me. That's OK. Right? We're allowed to be different from each other. We are. So all three of these things are true all at the same time. So any inclusive policy you build or system you build, it should acknowledge the sameness. It should understand and adapt for the differences, and it should allow some breathing room. So like, for example, one, one thing that you saw me do right at the top when someone asked about my pronoun, I changed the name and I said, you know, anyone can choose to rename themselves, you know, to rename themselves to put their pronoun if they want. Understanding that some trans people are going to feel very affirmed by being asked to share their pronouns, other people won't, right? You got to allow for those differences there, if that makes sense. Okay. So to continue on thinking about some of these core concepts, once we've got this in place, oh yeah, and then there's uh, there's Gino's name there. Anyone who is LGBTQ who's on this call who's not already enrolled in the Pride study at Stanford, Dr. Abedin Malover is one of the the you know authors or co-authors um, of that study. It's the first, the nation's first longitudinal study of trans health experiences and outcomes, LGBTQ health experiences and outcomes, um, and incredible research coming out of the Pride study on abortion access, reproductive care, specifically for people assigned female at birth. I'm going to talk about that language on the next slide um, with some more assigned male at birth research coming. And I get to be a part of that. So I'm very excited. Okay. So when I think about just explaining at the fundamental level, what does it mean to be LGBTQ? What does it mean to be trans? What is non-binary? The way that I think about it is to think about the four pillars of identity or, or four different parts of who we are. We all have way more than just four, right? But with these concepts, four is a good starting place. The first one being your assigned sex at birth, right? Most people are assigned either male or female at birth by a midwife or a doctor based on visible anatomy, maybe also based on a prenatal scan or blood work, right? So usually, again, it's, this is thought of as male, female, as a binary. We now know, many cultures have always known that this is a spectrum, even like our legal sex, even our medical sex, it's a spectrum, right? But that's the first place we're starting from is assigned sex at birth. And if you had to ask, for example, if you are a a provider and you don't have the option in your electronic medical records or EMR to do an anatomy selection process, which a lot of the, the most forward-thinking EMRs now simply allow patients to, to check mark. <laughs> what organs do you have? Do you have a prostate? Yes or no. Do you have breast tissue? Yes or no. Do you have fallopian tubes? Less or, yes or no. And that way the system is set up to make sure that people get you know, there's a trigger for getting those preventative care notifications, um, but that they don't get ones that are either irrelevant or even could be harmful, right? I don't want to get a reminder for a mammogram every few years now that I'm officially a trampa uh, because I've had top surgery. I don't want that, right? And that could, you know, it could, it could be triggering for me. That, that could, it could not feel great for me. Um, but if you don't have that option, and you have to ask someone, what was your assigned sex at birth? That's how you would ask them. The best practice is to actually ask someone first, what is their gender identity? Then to ask someone, what is their assigned sex at birth? So you're showing, and this is from the Fenway Institute's research on data collection processes, you're showing that what matters most to you as a provider or an institution is who they see themselves. 
And then second, what was there assigned sex at birth, right? So there, there is a science to that. And again, that, that research is out of Fenway. And in the community, we often shorthand assigned sex at birth to AMAB, which is assigned male at birth, or AFAB, assigned female at birth. So if you have a teenager or you yourself are queer or trans, you probably already know that language. But if you see it, that's what we're referring to. Um, and I'm going to use that language just a little bit throughout this training. So I just want to flag it for you here, right? So we have our assigned sex at birth. What is a doctor or midwife put on our birth certificate when we're born? Then we have gender identity, who we know ourselves to be on the inside, uh, man, woman, or this is a spectrum somewhere in between above or beyond. And that's non-binary. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, right? So we have gender identity shows up around, I don't know, age three to five. Then we have gender expression. So that's how we show the world what our gender is. Spectrum, right? You may be more feminine, you may be more masculine, you may be in the middle, but some of these things we have control over, like how long or short our hair is, um, what kinds of clothes we wear, others we don't have control over, like how big our hands are. But if you can see, like I can literally palm a basketball. I have giant hands. They called me man hands in middle school. To have these hands on a 12-year-old girl, not good, awkward, horrible, painful. Now I am the envy of all of my trans friends. <laughs> They're like, damn, dude, how'd you get such big hands? <laughs> I don't have control over that, right? How tall or short we are and the way that our culture genders, height, or size of hands, or pitch of voice, right? So that's gender expression. And then sexual orientation, who we're attracted to or interested in relationships with. More attracted to men, more attracted to women, attracted to people across the gender spectrum, not attracted to anyone at all. That's there. So if we were to map me, I was assigned female at birth. And as you know, my birth certificate still says female on it, thanks to the government of Canada. And my gender identity, who I know myself to be, is a man. So I am transgender. Trans, that prefix meaning to cross over, like translucent or transparent. You can see over to the other side. Um, pop in the chat and tell me what's it called when your gender identity is in alignment with your assigned sex. Wow, I really still cannot see the chat when I'm sharing my screen. That is like, what? I'm going to stop sharing right now. Oh yeah, thank you, Andrea, for putting the Dr. Uh, Abedin Malibur in there. Um, <clears throat> Same way how cisgender, yeah. Well, <clears throat> y'all have some very creative ways of spelling cisgender, which I know you can't all see, which is just to protect me from transphobia in the chat and to protect you all as well. So I'll just pop in the chat and say, yeah, it's cisgender, C-I-S, it comes from Latin. I guess all trans people are nerds. I don't know. We love language. That's the stereotype. Oh my gosh. I told you that I had ADHD. If you didn't believe me, now you know for reals. There was a bald eagle outside of my window. Oh, this is a really good day. Oh, mm, okay. Now I'm in a very good mood. <laughs> Literally could have held up the camera if I caught it early enough and you could have seen it. Oh. Oh, it never gets old. I could see like 12 in a day and I would it would never get old. Okay, I'm back. Yes, cisgender prefix, it just means on the same side as. I will say, especially for those in the public health field, a lot of folks still don't know what that means. So if you happen to be a researcher, still explain in the question, do you consider yourself transgender? What is that? What does that mean? You're assigned sex at birth what was on your birth certificate this current is different from your current gender identity or what gender you know yourself to be for example are you you have to really define it um, if you want to remain accessible in your work i think i mentioned already i do a lot of work um, with people who are incarcerated um, and i think about accessibility all the time that not everyone has access to all of this language and all of this education so as much as you can remind people this is what this means give a definition that way you can you can continue to stay accessible. So yeah, cisgender is that word there. It's value neutral. It's not a bad word, right? It's just a, a value neutral way of describing people who are not trans. Um, and we need that word because up until that word was popularized, I believe it first showed up in academic literature in 1998, but it really didn't get 
like it didn't hit the mainstream until, you know, five to seven years ago. Because before then, educators like myself, we didn't have a way to describe people who weren't trans. And what happens linguistically is there's this feeling that gets conveyed that's like, well, if you're a sign sex and your gender identity don't line up, you're this other thing. If they do line up, you're normal, right? So if we don't have a word to describe something, we end up kind of thinking that that's the norm then. It's so normal, we don't even need a word for it. The other thing, and especially for those of you who are doing this work at that 201 or 301 level, is we're not able to talk about privilege. We're not able to talk about access or disparities in health, right? We're not able to talk about those things if we don't have a word to describe what is the privileged identity versus what is the less privileged or marginalized identity. So, okay, we're gonna keep going. <clears throat> I don't know what my gender expression is. I think of myself as being more in the middle. When I was making the slide deck, my partner looked over my shoulder and was like, you're not androgynous. Like you have short hair, you know, you wear like traditionally masculine or, you know, clothes. So I think that's a good example of how subjective gender expression is. It's so cultural. It's so subjective. And a lot of your patients or community members that you work with, they may think that they're putting something out that you are not picking up at all, at all. Um, and part of that can come from dysphoria. And I don't have that on the slide here, but it does mention get mentioned a lot in the medical literature. So I'll say, you know, dysphoria is the feeling of profound discomfort with one's body and the way it aligns with one's gender or one's body and the way the world views the, the you know, how your body and the gender can line up. Dysphoria ends up being really important because it's, it's re currently recognized as a medical condition, as a psychological condition. It's how most trans people are able to access transition related care. Right, so the problem is not that we're trans, the problem is that we have discomfort with that, and that's called dysphoria. That's something that can be diagnosed and treated using gender affirming care, right? It's imperfect. Do trans people love the fact that there's like a gatekeeping aspect? Like we kind of have to prove that we have something that's diagnosable, a diagnosable mental condition in order to access care? No. Does it happen to be the way that we've hacked the current system to get care? Yes. In fact, I was part of a lot of conversations maybe 15 years ago about taking, you know, change, changing that. And it was actually Canadian activists who said, please do not take gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria out of the DSM, the diagnostic something, something. Um, Andrea can put that in the chat. I know you will. Um, please don't do that because as a, so, a country with socialized medicine, then we will not get any access to transition-related care, right? So often there is a reason why we have had to do things a certain way. Um, yeah, so that's me. The words I would use to describe myself are I'm a gay transgender man, right? So you wouldn't call me a transgender woman. I mean, you could, I'm not the boss of you. I don't care what you do, um, but you, it would be very confusing to other people. A transgender woman is some, traditionally someone who's assigned male at birth, who identifies as a woman or non-binary, right? Anywhere outside of that part of the gender identity thing. So that's the opposite of me. Um, you wouldn't call me non-binary because we're going to talk about this in a second, but you see my, agen my gender identity, it's all the way over to the side. So I'm considered a binary transgender man. Again, if that's too confusing for you because this is new, Great. For the people at the 201 or the 301, that's where I am. And in the trans community, I'm actually considered to have quite that, a, quite a bit of privilege. Some of the systems, as imperfect as they are, some of those pathways have been worn, right, by other binary trans people or by people who think of being trans as a, a pretty binary thing, going from one to the other, right? So things, some, a lot of things are going to be much easier for me than someone who is non-binary. Right, So we all have our own little understanding as well of levels there. I'm going to talk about non-binary in just one moment. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see the chat and make sure that um, I see anything there. Great. Um, yeah, so someone's saying, let's not forget the intersection of race. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, there are so many other di dimensions to who we are. Right. And they're going to impact how we're perceived in terms of our gender identity, our gender expression. Um, 
<clears throat> it's going to impact how we're treated by providers. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. Ooh, someone's asking a really nerdy researcher question. I'm going to, I want to get into that. I really do. And I'm going to keep going because I'm looking at the time and I want to be mindful of the time that we have together. Um, so love the question. Cannot answer it yet. If we get through the rest of my content, then we might have time. Okay. So non-binary is a compound word used to describe anyone whose gender identity is not strictly man or woman. The poet and my friend Nomi Lam describes it as having a gender that is somewhere in between, above, or beyond, right? Most non-binary people I know, they would hate the fact that I'm even doing this four pillars of identity because it's still rooted in a binary. Yes, you are 100% correct. And most of my work does operate in a developmentally appropriate space, right? So we have to understand, I understand, I feel and believe that there's that 101, the 201, the 301. Most of my work sits squarely in that 101. First, we have to get to this place of like, ooh, it's not a binary, it's a spectrum. That's the work that I do. And then whoever is at that 201 or 301 level, they're going to take that spectrum thing and be like, ugh, this sucks. What if it's a galaxy and genders are the stars in the galaxy? That's great. That's great. This is just my way that ends up working for me and the way that I, I do the work that I do. So love all the other ways of thinking about it. And you may have an opportunity to go to other sessions that, that explore that as well. But very rudimentarily, non-binary, it's right there. You can have any assigned sex and be non-binary. You can have any gender expression and be non You can have any sexual orientation or none at all. Non-binary is only about who you are, your gender on the inside. And that's really important for providers to understand. Even if someone shows up in your office um, or at your clinic or in your center or in your classroom, if they and they present in a way that you're reading as feminine because of your own cultural things, they may still be non-binary. And if they use gender neutral pronouns, it, it doesn't matter if they're more feminine presenting or masculine or if they're, who they're attracted to, what they're assigned sex, but none of that matters. They can be just non-binary. A couple other things we know about non-binary folks. The phrase itself, the compound word non-binary is newer, but people knowing themselves to be something other than a man or a woman, that's existed throughout all of oral and written history on every continent on the planet. Um, we also know that about a third of all trans adults are non-binary. I think that's cool. And that, that data is old as hell, 2016. My dad is a, 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 is a, was an endocrinologist for many years and has been, before he retired, did, has been doing trans health since the 70s, so since before I was born. Um, and I asked him, how old does the study have to be on trans health for you to discount the results? And he said, two years. <laughs> and I laughed and he did not. He's like, I'm serious. Like so much is changing medically and culturally that we have to really apply a critical eye to studies that are done more than two years ago because it may no longer be valid. So as of 2016, data collected in 2015, a third of all trans adults are non-binary. And that new, the new up, the updated trans discrimination survey is now live so people can take it. And we should have new data in the next two years. So that'll be exciting. We also know that most non-binary people use gender neutral pronouns, which is a pronoun other than he or she. And a majority of those folks use they, them pronouns. Not everyone. Some use binary pronouns, he or she. Some use mix. So he slash they or she slash he, meaning in some situations one, in some situations the other, but they want you to switch it up. The only way you can know is to ask, hey, I noticed you're using, you have a compound uh, <clears throat> pronoun on your you know, name tag or in your chart, you know, do you have any requests for me and how I use those pronouns, right? Well, this is just what we can see at the aggregate level here. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to go into how to use gender neutral language and pronouns. That's a whole other training I do. We're going to go right now into the, the policy stuff. Um, but I want to look at the questions to see if anything else. Oh, yes. I love this one. <clears throat> so <clears throat> people are saying, tell me more about non-binary. I would love to. So one of the questions is like, 
do non-binary people identify as trans? The data shows us that most, like over 80% of non-binary people see themselves as part of the trans community. Technically, transgender is an umbrella term. So like, yeah, non-binary is there, but people are people. I would say like my partner identifies as non-binary, but not trans. Um, okay, that happens. Um, yeah. And so, all right, fine. I've gotten two questions now, how to capture it in research. So the, the best practice that I'll say right now that I really love, and this comes from the pride study, which I really do think is the gold standard of, of data collection. Um, what they do is, is they'll do an open field question. So how would you describe your gender blank? And then they'll say, if you had to categorize your gender, which of the following works best for you? So it's a forced choice. And then it, then it would be like transgender man, transgender woman, non-binary, something else. And that way you're allowing people the freedom to say for themselves. And you're able to, especially if you're working with like quantitative data, you're going to then be able to actually do some aggregation and look for common themes and trends. It's, it is, it's so hard to look at groups of people. If you have 58 hundred different gender identities, then it's hard to say like, well, then where are the disparities? So I like blank and then forced choice. Um, and also it's really important to do the blank first so then people can be as authentic as possible. If you ask them to do the first forced choice first, it's not going to feel good. Um, so, okay. All right. I'm going to keep going. I'm also going to look at the Q and A. Anything else? Okay, great. That we're going to get there. All right. So now let's talk about anti-trans political attacks. This is when it's going to get juicy. This is also when we're going to start talking about some gnarly transphobia. So again, just that little flag for folks. Most trans people are like, yeah, Tristan, I have experienced transphobia. You don't need to protect me, but I don't know. I like my people. I want to take care of everyone. Okay. So to really understand the many anti-trans laws and the rise and fall of different kinds of them, the first thing that's important to understand is that transphobia is an, it is a complex and rigid ideology. So this is where a lot of people get it wrong, especially ally supporters. People think like, oh, transphobia is just like they're just bigoted. They just have hate in their heart. They don't understand. They're afraid of what's different. No, maybe that's some people. That is not the organized anti-trans right. There is a mental model of transphobia. There are core beliefs from which everything else springs. So it's really important to understand what are those core beliefs so that when you do advocacy work or when you do interpersonal uh, communication or or persuasion, you have to understand what's at the root of a lot of the policies that are starting to creep up. The door to the transphobia house is trans equals bad, <laughs> right? That is the, that to get into the transphobia house, you have to go through that door. The belief that being trans is wrong, morally or ethically, or that it is somehow bad, right? That's the foundational principle of everything else. So that's where we start. The belief that being trans is bad. And we get through the, the, the entryway of gender essentialism. <laughs> if we were all in one big room, I would like call on people and be like, who can tell me what that is? But I'm going to keep barreling on, especially keeping an eye on time. I could nerd out forever about this, but we're already quite a ways into our time. Gender essentialism is the belief that there are males and females. There are men and women. There's masculinity and femininity, and never the twain shall meet. That it is both normal and natural that what you are born is what you will always be. <laughs> what you are born is what you will always be. It is somehow both natural and normal, but also must be policed all the time. This is one thing that I'm like, mm, there are some logical problems here. It's either natural that there's just two genders or we have to make sure that kids know that all the time and that we penalize anyone who isn't in that category. I'm like, is it normal or natural? 
or no, right? But somehow it's both in this belief system. Two genders, normal, natural, and must be policed. Why? Because being trans is a choice. It is a mutable characteristic. And whether being trans is mutable or immutable, meaning like, is it a choice or not, is really important in the legal context. Because a lot of our laws that protect people from discrimination are rooted in this belief that you shouldn't be punished for something that you have no control over. Right? That's where a lot of the sex-based discrimination protections come from. You, sh you can't choose if you're a man or a woman. right? You're just born that way. So you shouldn't be able to be discriminated against. You can't choose what your race is. So, right? so if they can have this fundamental belief that being trans is a choice that can either be supported by families, by culture, by schools, by woke parents, or discouraged, right? If we think that trans is bad and it is a choice, well, then we have to make sure that as many people as possible are choosing not to be trans, right? So that's another key characteristic of these transphobic movements. Next, fine. If people are going to be transgender because it's bad and because it's a choice, who would choose it? People who are crazy. And I'm, I'm using that word very specifically, right? This is part of transphobia, right? That somehow there is something wrong with people who would have chosen this bad thing, which is me, right? And that somewhere in there, someone who would choose that would also choose to do other predatory things. And then the last one, no, we've got two more. There's also this weird room of people will pretend to be trans to get something. <laughs> and this one is particularly silly to me, but it shouldn't be. It's nothing to be laughed at. It's, it's actually gotten the anti-trans right really far. Um, but this one is silly to me because, um, for example, I was speaking to a whole whole high school, amphitheater, me on stage, all the high school students, freshmen, all the way, seniors. Um, and someone asked the question, like, well, like, what about trans athletes? And like, wouldn't someone, couldn't someone then pretend to be trans to be able to like use the women's locker room? And so I said, well, here we've got about 600 high schoolers, I, I, you know, I, my guess is about 300 of you are boys. Raise your hand, boys, if you would be willing to grow your hair out, wear makeup every day, uh, change your name, wear women's clothes, uh, deal with getting made fun of and teased for being transgender just for the opportunity to possibly use uh, women's, uh, the girls' locker room. Not a single hand went up. So I'm just like, no one's doing this, you know, but it doesn't matter. None of this is based in reality, right? This is just the, the mental model of transphobia. And then there's a new little room that's starting to crop up, which is that uh, somehow transition-related care is dangerous or experimental, right? So if you can see that it's like, okay, fine, if we don't want to go in the being trans is bad door, can we crawl in the window? of transition being experimental or dangerous. Can we crawl in the window of, okay, fine, I'm not saying that trans people are bad, but someone could pretend to be trans to get something, to do something bad, right? So you can kind of see the ways that it creeps in, but understanding that this is the model we're working with and all of the all of the policies kind of spring from this, this house of hate, <laughs> if you will. And each of these different beliefs is going to either be strengthened or weakened by different messages that are used culturally and in campaigns. So we start to see throughout time, and I'm, I'm only speaking about America here, I'm not even speaking about Canada, but so this is only in a US context, right? We see different types of frames playing out publicly, politically, culturally, socially, starting with a really like a really strong frame of like security, safety, defense. Meaning most political movements or social movements in this, in that time frame, are going to be operating within that framework, right? So like we need to protect our children. They are coming for our jobs, 
right? That's a security safety frame. It's not the movement frame we're in right now, but people are still like hearkening back to it. And that's a frame that does serve the right very well. That's why that line there is red. And I apologize for those of you who are colorblind. So I'll just tell you it's, uh, it's red there. As that started to die out a little bit, we start to get more into this conversation about rights. So this is like women's rights, animal rights, environmental rights. We start to talk a little bit about discrimination, right? And we start to talk about fairness. And that those are messages that do serve the left a little better. We have like a little better, little bit. But again, we can start to see some of the messages around the anti-trans bills are about women's right to privacy. Ooh, now you're taking our frame and you're using it against us. I see what you're doing. Okay. But you can also see like, I have a shirt that says protect trans kids. Ooh, that's, that's me playing into the safety or defense frame, right? I'm turning their frame against them. Right? So we can start to see some of these moving. And then we get really back into more of a right-wing framing of individualism, freedom. And in fact, a lot of the movements now, the um, freedom for all Americans, freedom to marry, right? It's a right-wing framing that the left is like, what about our freedom? Right? So we see these different waves because ultimately movements are, are really a, a contest of story, of messaging, of like who can make the best case, who can tap into these values that people have. And we think, we hope, we thought that we are moving towards a movement that was a little bit more of that love, interdependence, collectivity, I am my brother's keeper. Some of the messaging around trans youth, like, you know, even some of the like protection, the safety, like protect trans youth, that's also a little bit, right? About like, how are we all interconnected? Those are our kids in a lot of ways. These are, these are our kids. So these are the ways that movements rise and fall. And you'll start to see as we look at actual attacks, the different frames that they're hitting on. The ones that are going to do the best, meaning are going to be the most successful, the ones that are going to start to lean into this feeling of interdependence like collectivity, the ones that are going to fail are the ones that are going back on that safety, security, or defense. And I call this whack-a-mole. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like those machines at the carnival where you hit one and another one pops up, you hit the one and another. That's the thing. And I think, and I worked on a lot of marriage campaigns, and I think a lot of people in the LGBTQ movement felt as soon as we get marriage, whew, like that'll be the turning point, not realizing that as soon as we get marriage, something else is going to crop up and then something else is going to crop You know, it's an ongoing struggle. There, we just don't get to hang our hats up. <laughs> so we started, we saw a lot of like cat and mouse. It's like two metaphors in one slide that's going to make my head hurt. But a lot of like, California is saying we can get married. Okay, well, Arkansas is going to say no gay people can get married. Same thing with discrimination. You know, we're going to pass pro-discrimination, anti-discrimination language. Like there's this cat and mouse all the way from 98 to 2012. I was on the ground in 2012 in three of these four states working on marriage. <laughs> then in June of 2015, the Supreme Court said gay people can get married. By November of 2015, by November, anti-trans attacks ramped up around the country. Less than six months later, June, July, August, September, October, November, five months later, by then, like on the ballot. So these are the same humans. It's not even like some tangential metaphor of like, our struggles are all connected. No, literally the people who are keeping gays from getting married, a month later, we're keeping trans people from you know, using the bathrooms or whatever. Um, and we can even see this numerically. This is not a pretty slide. I did not make this graph, um, but it still illustrates the point. 2015, we've got, you know, 65 anti-LGBT bills in le state legislatures. A lot of religious exemptions, meaning if I say I'm religious, I shouldn't have to bake your cake or whatever. Um, a lot of we're going to protect state officials who do not want to have to marry 
two men. That sounds like they're actually getting married, but you know what I mean? Like perform the ceremonies. <laughs> no one's trying to make you marry gay men. <laughs> um, some, again, like preemption of non-discrimination, meaning you, we're not going to make, we're not going to allow cities in our states to pass non-discrimination, right? So, okay, marriage falls, bam. Now, all of a sudden, we've got bathroom bills. I'm going to talk about those in just a second. Right, so we can see they lose on marriage, they go after trans people. Then, oh no. So 2016, 2017, all of these bathroom bills, they do not go well. <laughs> they do not go well because they're they're based in a safety, safety frame. Women and children need to be protected from trans people or people pretending to be trans. That's a safety frame. It doesn't really work that well anymore. So then after they failed, in 18, 19, they're like, oh, fine. What are we going to do now? So it's not that they go away. They're just thinking, planning. What do they decide they want to try? Let's prevent trans people from being able to access medical care. Let's prevent trans kids from playing on the sports teams that are in alignment with their gender. It's whack-a-mole. They're going to try this. We smack them down. They're going to try this. We smack them down. It's an ongoing fight. Another way to look at this, and then I'm going to stop sharing before I look at go into specific types of bills. Um, another way to look at this is, and this goes all the way to 2020, is just like at an aggregate number. <clears throat> See, here's this regrouping period, 2018, 2019. We're looking at the orange here is anti-trans bills specifically. The gray is other anti-LGBTQ bills. Look at the proportions. Look at the ratios. 2018, 2019 is anti-LGBTQ is more than anti-trans. Starting in 2020, all the way up until today, now we're looking at more trans than LGBTQ. Politically expedient, easier to come after us. We have less of a base of support. And then this number is out of date. It's as of March 15, but I couldn't find a, I like this graph. It's pretty to me. It's aesthetically pleasing and I couldn't find any other pretty ones. <laughs> but Hopefully that's helpful. All right, we're going to talk about the types of bills right now. And so I'm just going to look at the chat. Out of state groups and bill factories push South Dakota to be one of the first states to press for these anti-trans legislation. Yeah, it's not cute. So we're going to talk about some of them right now. The first type I know a lot about because it was piloted for the first time that I saw it anyway, is in 2019. Um, and you're gonna have to watch this disgusting commercial. I'm so sorry, but it's uh, needs to be seen. Uh, okay, so the first type of bill we're gonna talk about are bathroom bills, right? Ugh. So we'll just watch this commercial. This was a, this was, what did someone say? Like a, like a policy farm? So they said bill factory. Yes. This was created by one organization and then was repurposed in states all over the country. So it's 30 seconds long. It's gross. I'm sorry. Here you go. There we go. So same bill was repurposed in Kalamazoo when I was there. Same exact commercial. And the really silly thing is, let me see, I think I put it right here, right? The really silly thing is bathroom bills only showed up because, let me see, did I put this on the slide already? No, I didn't, so I'll just tell you. So a lot of cities around the country tried to pass and sometimes successfully pass non-discrimination laws, right? You cannot kick someone out of their house. You cannot deny them a job. You can't kick them out of school. You can't kick them out of your cab or your restaurant because of their gender identity. You just can't, right? Straightforward. And then these started to pass all over the country. And so the anti-trans right tried to figure out like, how do we beat back these bills? One of the ideas they had was 
what if we say that men can go into women's restrooms? So of all the silly things they try to defeat non-discrimination bills, this was the thing. This idea is the thing that caught on. So then they took that idea and they made it a whole thing. So essentially bathroom bills attempt to force trans people to use bathrooms that are in alignment with their legal sex or with their assigned sex at birth. It depends on what kind of state you're talking about. This is a solution without a problem. I don't wanna say there's never been an instance of someone pretending to be a gender they're not to get into the bathroom and do something silly, but doing bad things in bathrooms is like already illegal. You've been peeing next to trans people your whole life without noticing it with no problems. Bathrooms are way more dangerous for trans people than for a cis person who has to pee in a stall next to it. You know what I mean? So, but it hits a lot of the points. So they thought this was going to work, right? It hits on that safety frame. We're protecting women and children. Trans people are predators. Someone might pretend to be a trans person to get something special, right? So it hits on a lot of those points. It didn't really go very well, right? So they mostly lost on these. So those really dropped off pretty pretty drastically in 2019. Um, but again, the language dates all the way back to 27, 28, 29, when we were starting to see these this language being used in the non-discrimination context. Questions about the bathroom bills? Again, they've mostly gone, oh shoot, someone said they couldn't see the video. I hope other people were able to see the video. Okay, other people did. Sorry, maybe on the recording it'll show up. Hopefully it will. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. So people saw it. They watched it. Great. So that's the first type of bill that we're, we looked at. We're going to look at is those bathroom bills. And again, it's whack-a-mole. We defeated the bathroom bill. We were like, this is stupid. Most people were like, yeah, this is silly. We're not going to. So the bathroom bill started to die. But then other things came forward. The next type of bill that I want to look at. Um, oh, I'll, I guess the final thing I'll say for the bathroom bill is just some of the health implications of not being able to use the restroom when you need to go. Not to like gross anybody out, but I did get a kidney infection in March of this year because I was in a doing, uh, I had a consulting client in rural Oregon and it was a really long drive and I didn't, I didn't stop because I didn't want to use a public bathroom like in a gas station or like the side of the road rest stop things. I'm just always scared. What if the lock doesn't work? Someone comes in and say, whatever. And so I held it too long. I got a kidney infection. It was not, it was not cute. Um, so the real physical impacts are not good. The medical impacts are not good. And then of course we can just talk about the psychological effects of being seen as a predator and having that be on your TV. Because that gets us into the next type of bill, which has been gaining steam. So what you say? Anyways, it's been getting, you know, getting some traction and actually has been passing in quite a few states. Is this trans athlete ban? And to understand, and this is just like very convoluted. So to understand some of what they're thinking is before we talk about why it is so silly. Here's like literally 20 seconds of um, of Governor DeSantis talking about why they needed in the middle of a pandemic to prioritize a law banning trans girls from playing in school sports. Here's his thing. We're not only making sure women have opportunities for scholarships and competition at the highest level, we're also putting uh, in statute ways to actually vindicate the rights of any women athletes who may be discriminated against. So one other thing to note under this new law, students can actually sue a school if it allows a female transgender athlete to play on a ladies team. Okay, so what are we hearing here? Oh, dang, they're taking our discrimination language. Now they're saying that trans athletes are discriminating against women and girls who are defenseless and need to be protected, right? So we're starting to see like some some things creeping in. This is a little bit of like coming in the window, right? So they're not necessarily saying being trans is bad, but 
they're trying to play also on the fairness, right? The fairness equal rights type of a thing, and it's unfair. And so that's what these statewide laws ban is that it forces trans youth to place on sports teams who that are in alignment with their legal sex or assigned sex at birth. A lot of these bills are only targeting trans girls or young people who are assigned male at birth with no regard for whether they have been on hormones, which make them, you know, uh, physiologically in alignment, developmentally and athletically in alignment with other cisgender girls who are on teams with no acknowledgement of the fact that there are many unfair advantages that people have in athletics. If you're born and you happen to be tall, that's an unfair advantage, but you don't see people saying, well, we should ban tall people from uh, competing in basketball, right? Of course not. We're like, dang, that's lucky, <laughs> right? So that's what these, these bans are looking like. It's mostly a solution without a problem. So there are very, very very few states where there are actually, again, like, I don't want to, I don't want to be like stereotypical here. I don't know a lot of trans people who are fighting to be on sports teams. It's just, it's a thing. It's not really a thing. And in most of the states where this was passed, they couldn't actually point to a single instance of a young trans girl trying to play on a female sports team. And in fact, it has created whole brand new problems. For example, in the state of Texas, they will not allow um, trans boys, so young people who are like me, assigned female at birth, playing on boys teams, to play on the boys teams. So the rest, the high school wrestling champion from last year was a young transgender man who had been on testosterone, which is basically steroids. It's the same thing. They wouldn't let him play on the boys teams. So he beat all the girls because he's much stronger than them because he's on testosterone. So like, how is that fair if the goal is fairness? You know what I mean? So it's mostly a solution without a problem. But we talked about this already. It does hit on the, that rights framing, including, remember the hallway of gender essentialism. Look, if you are born male, you are a boy, you have to play on the boys teams, period. That's who you will always ever be. As well as a little bit of this, you can't pretend to be somebody else. This is happening all over the place. It's been blocked by a judge in Idaho, but I think Idaho is actually the first to pass one of these. Um, Alabama, Iowa, Florida, Louisiana, even the states where this isn't a law. In most other states, you still have to apply. So if you're a trans youth and you wanna play on a team that's in alignment with your gender, not your assigned sex at birth, you have to apply. In some cases, trans boys can play on boys' teams, but trans girls can't play on girls' teams, or it's case-by-case -case basis. It's based on whether you've been on hormones or not. Sometimes it's based on a medical exam. As a parent, I'm like, mm, don't like that. I don't, I don't want someone having to look at my kid. Ugh, I don't even want to talk about that. Okay, so it's a second kind of thing. And just as the bathroom bills are dying down, this is still very much a point of contention and a part of the conversation. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing before I go to the next one. I'm gonna look in here. Yes, and this is someone else is saying they didn't care about women's sports until they could use it as a weapon, 100%. All of these very conservative legislate, legislators now being like, all of a sudden they care about equality and women's athletics. And I'm like, really? Like how many bills to fund women's athletic teams have you sponsored, right? It, it doesn't hold up. Um, and yes, yeah, so someone is saying like many cisgender black women have had their sex and gender police in the same way. Absolutely. This gender policing piece is connected to so many other things. And just as we talk about how, you know, like uh, gender expression is very cultural, it's, it's very racialized as well. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, nine to 10 years, South Dakota High School Activities Association had a policy with no issues. Then the governor had to scapegoat for political brain, uh, gain. Yeah, so it's a, a solution in search of a problem. Someone else says that they were a former collegiate swimmer and current youth swim coach. Um, and obviously people are, um, you know, they are very much aware of this conversation. Um, and people are, are, you know, asking if I am aware of any recent or ongoing studies. You know, what we have found, you know, what we have found is that uh, essentially once someone is on hormones, they are like very much in alignment with 
cisgender women, trans women, but maybe they are taller because the way that hormones impact the body throughout puberty um, does inf influence, like per in particular height is one, not muscle tone is in another. So, you know, some effects, some not effects. However, um, maybe because a lot of your researchers will understand this, but there are more differences between and among cisgender women than there are between cisgender women and trans women. So like the variability in athleticism between like among cis women is far greater than between cis women and trans women. Another way of putting it is there are just as many trans women who are not great athletes <laughs> as there are cis women who are fantastic athletes. Um, you may get, you know, one or two outliers like we're seeing in the Olympics. Um, but that's probably, again, just like a, a fluke of sometimes like someone is lucky and we may happen to code that as being because they're trans or not, but doesn't Michael Phelps have the like genetic thing where his body produces more of the recovery, like the muscle recovery hormone. Um, and I'm like, you know, everyone looks at him and they're like, whoa, cool. Good for him. Right. Why don't we look at a trans athlete? And we're like, oh, it must've sucked for her to have to go through uh, you know, a puberty that wasn't in alignment with her gender identity, that must have sucked, but hey, made her better at swimming. That's cool. You know, we don't have that same like laissez-faire or even like, you know, uh, celebratory attitude towards it when it happens to be um, about, oh, oh my gosh, we are literally four minutes away from our time. Why did you all let me just rant and rave? Okay, we're going to go quickly through my next things. Oh, okay, no more videos. That's all right. Okay. Trans youth health bans. These force trans youth to stay closeted. It prohibits affirming services of any kind. And in some cases even punishes or criminalizes affirming schools or parents. This is very much in that we have to protect kids. We gotta keep kids safe. It's about safety. Through that door, the, the hallway of gender essential, essentialism. It's also tra being trans is a choice. Therefore, kids can choose not to be trans. And we should do everything we can to make sure. And this is somewhat of a solution without a problem. So being trans isn't bad. Both trans youth go on to identify as trans as adults, even if they didn't, okay. It's true that most gender affirming care is reversible. And we do know that gender affirming care is life-saving. However, there are some fertility implications of early transition. However, we don't see long, we, we don't have enough data yet to see whether that does have a long-term negative mental health effect. So for example, if a young person goes on puberty blockers, never produces uh, uh, gametes, then goes on to transition, yeah, their fertility is going to be stymied or even will go away completely. However, do we have any trans adults saying, I wish I hadn't done that? Not yet. We might. What we're hearing right now is, oh, that was a life-saving process for me. And that was a trade-off that I'm, I'm willing to make. So, uh, oh no, two more minutes. All right. I just wanted to say that a lot of what is told about transition options for youth is not true. So pre-adolescent gender affirming care is nothing medical, all social. You can cut your hair, you can grow out your hair, you can change your name. When we talk about trans youth, affirming trans youth, this is what we're talking about. Everything that's reversible right? Just social. So when we get into adolescence, only if a trans youth shows that their gender identity is insistent, consistent, and persistent, are they allowed to undergo some kind of gender affirming care, which might be puberty blockers, which are completely reversible, including from a fertility lens, which will delay their puberty, their natal puberty, allowing them a little more time to figure out what they want to do next and allowing their family a little more time as well. At age of medical consent, or 18, they're allowed to access hormones, depends on the state, um, and hormonal stuff is somewhat reversible, somewhat not, and then only at age of medical consent or 18 is, is surgery possible. Um, okay, oh, I had so many other slides. Whew. That's okay, this is because of the bald eagle, isn't it? If I hadn't let myself get distracted, <laughs> I couldn't have controlled it even if I wanted to, so there we go. So this is continuing to grow right? This idea that we need to protect youth 
from turning trans, uh, continuing to grow. Same thing with allowing providers to discriminate against trans people. In insurance, so in Arkansas, insurers can refuse to cover trans affirming, gender affirming care. In Medicaid, this is for a lot of you all because you're in public health, you, the state Medicaid policy specifically explicitly con excludes trans health coverage. Look at all these states. Come on, Arizona. What's going on over here? Really? Get it together. Hmm. And then these are the newer laws, which is, is calling child services or making it a felony to support your kid to transition. Again, in most of these cases, this is just like literally letting your kid go by a different name for a while. Um, okay. Hmm. How can I get to what can you do? Do the work. Use gender inclusive language. Get curious instead of judgmental. Get clear about who your, what your sphere of influence is. Do some administrative things. <laughs> Evolve your language. Build in processes of accountability and support. This is like, that's like 90% of what I do is training medical offices, research centers, et cetera, clinics, centers, hospitals um, on the principles of trans inclusive care. Mm. Yeah, we're just not gonna get to all the other things. But I did wanna put my email address up. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, I'm so sorry I didn't get to everything. Okay, I'm gonna put my work email in there. We can do more. Andrea, I went over by a minute. I'm so sorry. I'm getting so excited. Totally, totally fine. We all enjoyed the bald eagle. So it was totally worth it. Um, I'm wondering, um, and maybe I should ask you offline, but I already started, so I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm sure. Yes, you can show, put you on the spot and ask you here. Um, yeah. Those last couple of slides that you were showing in terms of what we can do, mm -hmm. um, is it possible for us to share that with everyone who registered? Yeah, that's fine. I'll, think, I'll, I'll export the slides and, and I'll, I'll I, I think that at least from what I know of my colleagues at the School of Public Health, we're all so hungry and excited to to turn our knowledge into action that I yeah. think that being able to to have more tangible steps in terms of what we can do within our sphere of influence um, would would be extremely helpful. Um, Absolutely. And because that's so much of the work that I do day to day, I was like, oh, I get to do something else. So I got I just got I just got very excited. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing not only your your lived experience, but also just your knowledge and your passion for wanting all of us to to just do something, right? I and and I think you were so brilliant in making the connection of how uh, trans rights and trans justice is something that matters to everyone, right? And and I think that. As someone who is a cisgender woman and someone who is also a parent, I, you know, I'm fully committed and I'm so excited to like dig deeper and learn more about how I can use my privilege to be able to, to rally for trans rights and trans justice. So I really, really appreciate your time. I see that people are asking for a part two. So we'll definitely um, chat with you about that as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this morning slash afternoon, um, Sarah was able to put the evaluation um, in the chat. So please fill that out and then we'll get out to you the video once it's uploaded and also um, those slides that Tristan was talking about at the end um, of how we can do something and what are those steps that we can that we can um, uh, put into action. So thank you again, everyone for joining, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.